All right, well, we are back. I hope you learned a little or enjoyed learning a little bit more about Emily Griffith. Um, so we're back with Elizabeth Nosick. She's the curator of education and exhibits at the Colorado Railroad Museum. Thanks for being on the show. Well, thank you for having me. We're very excited to be here. I'm here mostly to publicize our new education brochure, which I brought with me. And you could put on the screen now if you'd like. They told me to say that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you're the curator there. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means, like what you actually do at the museum? Well, I curate. And curator is an old word that means to care for. And it's actually synonymous with janitor, if you could believe it. But most curators think of themselves as highly intelligent, highly skilled caretakers. And I am highly intelligent and highly skilled, but I also take care of the education and the exhibits at the museum, which include taking care of historical objects such as what you see in front of you. Oh, okay. So what do we have in front of us here? Well, we have, and I brought a picture of, of the actual goose. We have a galloping goose model. We have two model um, gardens here at the museum, and the modeling goose um, and the model goose is a train that was made out of a vehicle. So if you look at it, it is made out of a car, but the wheels are actually rail car ra um, wheels. And what they did was after a few years of going up into the mountains in these heavy locomotives that cost a lot of money to steam up and keep moving, is they decided they needed to do it in an inexpensive way, but the United States Post Office had a contract with them. So they couldn't not take a train up there. And there were people now who lived up in the mountains who needed the train to get there. And so they decided to retrofit a vehicle for a train. And they called them geese because as they move, they kind of move like a goose. <laughs> so they kind of waddle as they move. They are absolutely beautiful. Traditionally, they are totally silver. This one has a little bit of a beige look to it. Um, but if you come to the museum, to the Colorado Railroad Museum, you get to see some of the galloping geese that were in existence and that were dealing with the mountain communities. There's also one at Knott's Berry Farm, and there's one up in Vail. Hmm. Do any of those still run up in the mountains? Not up in the mountains, but at our museum on steam up days, you may get to ride a galloping goose. Oh, cool. It That's is cool. cool. They really there's do one waddle. up on the screen right now. Mm -hmm. Is that one actually at your museum, or is this? Yes. Oh, okay. That's one of the ones we have at the museum that we run on certain steam up days, which are normally oh. a Saturday. Over the summer, we've been running um, train and locomotives every day. But during the winter months, during school months, we're only able to do it um, on the weekends on Saturdays. Gotcha. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the railroad track? You said, I think you said earlier, it's pretty old. Well, this is a narrow gauge railroad track from 1882. Okay. Can you, you hold you? it up? Yeah. They told me I'd be a Vanna. Um, <laughs> from 1882, and it is from the Alamosa, um, Colorado region. And it is just a section that was obviously cut mm -hmm. off. This piece was narrow gauge. Now, one of the points I want to make sure I make is narrow gauge is really discussing how far the tracks are from each other. It's not the size of the okay. track. So this is a cutoff piece of a piece of track that somebody cut a slice from. Mm. And it is also, it could also be a narrow gauge. It's all in the distance the two pieces are from each other. And the country went to standard gauge track because standard gauge um, works very nicely and is, is um, a smoother, can be a smoother ride. Narrow gauge is more um, useful in the mountains because as you turn a curve, and mountains do tend to have a lot of curves, you could use the narrow gauge. They were closer together and they could make those tighter curves. Mm -hmm. So the galloping geese were really great because they were small and they could go on narrow gauge, but as you um, were bringing supplies up to the mines, et cetera, that were up in the mountains, you really needed to be able to make those tight turns and you needed narrow gauge to do that. Mm -hmm. So the gauge determines um, how tight of a turn you can make, the, um, which makes a lot of sense if you think about radius. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a wider gauge, you're mm -hmm. going to, you know, the radius um, mm -hmm. is wider and therefore you're not able to turn as much. Is that right? The gauge allows you to make those tighter turns. The gauge doesn't, um, 
I need you to ask the question again. I apologize. So um, it, it, the, a smaller gauge means tighter turns yes. and a wider gauge means, means um, wider. wider turns. Exactly. And that's, that's because of the rate, like I, I'm thinking mathematically speaking, mm -hmm. the that makes radius sense, is turning. When you're turning, like the outer wheels have to go a further distance, right? Mm -hmm. than the right. Inner. So if you're going to have that difference, right, I guess you'd mm -hmm. have to do a lot of work to adjust a train so it can actually Be do that without. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And standard gauge was adopted because it was more stable overall. Mm -hmm. So for the places that didn't need the tight Guys turns, are good. it made more right. sense. Guys kind of the good. in between, okay. the like mm -hmm. sweet spot of like it still can make tight turns, but it mm -hmm. still makes exactly. sense. Exactly. So now a lot of times in Colorado, you'll see three tracks so that they can go either standard or narrow gauge. Because okay. now, because it's the oh. standard gauge, most trains want to use standard gauge track because of how the wheels are set on the vehicle. So in Colorado, a lot of times we'll have three tracks so that we can go either narrow or standard. And you can lay the tracks within? Mm -hmm. within the, well, so they one, lay? You'd use three, so you'd lay the, one, the third track within. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So okay, they're okay. always using one. One of them, the and same. it's just the distance from one of them. Exactly. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of cool, isn't it? It is really cool. Is that what the third rail is? In no, no probably not. Because <laughs> the third okay. rail is typically an electrically charged. Yeah, that's rail. what I thought. It was always like, 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 don't you know, touch mm -hmm. the third rail in the subway, and I was like, oh, maybe that's yeah, that's you're not supposed to pee on the third rail. <laughs> you can <laughs> touch the, the third <laughs> rail, but they really don't want you to put pennies on it. And this is something I learned since working here is that for safety reasons and to help keep the rails as smooth as they can so that the trains can run nicely on them, they don't want you to mash pennies or put things on the rail. Right. It's one of the big safety things that they try to teach at the museum and when we have safety classes, um, it's always mentioned. And I was one of those people guilty of putting a penny on the rail when I oh, was I a kid because it was fun. It's the most efficient kind way of, to flatten a penny. Yeah. Exactly. But, but don't it's do it. not safe because it will hurt the train. <laughs> could it also, could it also, I heard that it could um, um, fly, out. fly out of the tracks as well. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. And that's not an urban myth. That's for real. Mm -hmm. And you start, you start with a penny, and pretty soon I had a volunteer tell me about putting a big piece of wood on the track. <gasps> Oh, and no. he was five years old at the time. He didn't kill anybody, but the engineer had quite a talking to with him. Oh, um, yeah. Because they, they were able to stop the train. And trains don't stop on a dime. It takes no. quite a while to stop the train. Right. I have two more items here. I have a conductor's hat that doesn't have the emblem on it, but this is the kind of hat that would have been worn by a conductor who would check your ticket. And I have an actual ticket that would have been used by one of our Colorado trains. And oh, wow. what they would do is they would punch, punch the hole to where you were going, and they'd stick it up above your seat so the conductor would know when you needed to get off. Hmm. Back in the day, how much would it have cost me to go from like Denver to Grand Junction? I can't answer that oh, question okay. because it depends on what train you were taking sure. and what kind of baggage you're taking and whether you're taking first class or regular carriage. Sure. I mean, as a teacher, he's obviously taking first class. Oh, obviously. yeah. <laughs> right. so much yeah. Money. It's good to have a dream. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Something That's to true. work for. That is true. That is true. <laughs> so a question about you. Like, what brought you to the Colorado Railroad Museum? Did you have a background in, um, not in railroad in trains, or just not at all. a curator? My undergraduate degree is in cultural anthropology. I okay. knew in sixth grade I wanted to be a museum curator. Wow. I thought the word curator was the most beautiful word in the English language. And um, so I have worked in a lot of different museums. I've worked at um, the Smithsonian. I've worked for the National Park Service. I have worked for the Mission Houses Museum in Honolulu, Hawaii. I've worked in a lot of different types of museums, living history, et cetera. Never worked for a train museum. So what they hired me for were my skills um, working with exhibits and education okay. programs. What I'm learning is about trains, and I think that's what attracted me was there was something for me to learn. Mm -hmm. I yeah. love the job because you're always learning something, and I find it fascinating. That's very cool. I agree. I think that's really important. So would you be able to talk, Elizabeth, about the educational opportunities that the museum offers? Um, as I said, I have the education brochure you can put up. We have brand new education programs. Um, for the first time, we are being able to address the educational programs to um, state standards and curriculum standards. We have a couple of new programs that we're doing for our really young audiences, which is a basic train program where we're going to identify what types of trains, and I have pictures of those as well. 
We have freight trains at the museum. We have cabooses at the museum. And we have some locomotives. We also have freight cars. And actually, the museum has over 100 pieces of rolling stock. And we're very proud of that. A number of those pieces you can actually climb into. This um, one on the screen right now, caboose number 49, is one of the ones you can go inside and see what the caboose looks like in the real, real world and life size. Um, cabooses don't exist on trains today. They have another way of looking at those things, and most of the workers on a train are up in the front of the train. So this is a time period that has passed. This is a business car, and business cars were run by the superintendents of the consist, um, and they rode in these business cars that would have bedrooms and full kitchens and dining rooms. You can actually rent this business car at the museum and have a special dinner. If you want to propose to your girlfriend, you can do that. You can have a birthday party, etc. And this is a dining car picture from the late 40s, early 50s. And what we're talking about there is a wonderful exhibit that I did in April that will be up through the end of May. Um, called Eating on the Rails, where we talk about the traditions of how you get food on the train. And this is probably the nicest way to get food on the train. We also talk about butcher boys, and we talk about the Harvey girls and eating houses that were along the side of the train. And we talk about how some poor people brought picnic lunches that would decay as time went by as they traveled on the train. And the flies that came and the rodents that came and still they had to eat that. So there's a lot of variety in that exhibit. The dining car is one of the nicest um, parts about it. That's, I think, my favorite thing about traveling by train versus mm -hmm. versus driving or flying is mm -hmm. the dining. I really do yeah, agree. It's, it's my favorite. <laughs> well, and the high style of dining is, is so different than what it um, is today. You can still travel and have that high style dining. But a lot of times you're eating um, a little more on the fly, which mm -hmm. gives you more variety. But it, it's really interesting to see how food rose and fell in the world of dining and also in airplanes and things along that line. Mm -hmm. But um, fascinating topic, fun to look at, fun to think about. I think it's interesting, Definitely. like going back to that picture uh, of the people dining, um, mm -hmm. people used to dress a lot more formally. Oh, like they riding trains or airplanes. Train. Like I throw my sweatpants on and get on mm -hmm. the plane now. Everybody I, used to wear suits and very. Right. I see people in pajamas mm -hmm. on yeah. on airplanes. That I, would be me. You have to be comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> in the era of North by Northwest with Cary Grant, that era, you mm -hmm. can still get a sleeper car and you can still mm -hmm. have that wonderful experience, but it isn't quite as common as it once was. It used to be a part of our lives. Um, but please, um, we love the idea of people coming out and visiting that era because we have some of those trains. We have a late 1940s dining car that isn't open 100% to the public, but it will be open during the Polar Express. And we offer, I don't know if you've heard of the book, The Polar Express. Mm -hmm. We yeah. have a wonderful program that runs in November and December for family audiences for certain days of the week where you can come out at night in your pajamas and right. have a cup of cocoa and a You're cookie. You're supposed to this time. Yeah. <laughs> My formal pajamas. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And have a cup of cocoa and, and a cookie and meet Santa Claus and experience the Polar Express. That sounds so nice. And yeah. we so have cool. the diner open for that particular program. And you can also have the business card, depending on what ticket that you purchase. It's really special. Cool. Um, we have other pictures, too, of... Um, that we can see of the 1800s. Mm -hmm. So tell us about this. This is another um, image that is in the Eating on the Rails exhibit, and this is one of the first um, restaurant cars that you see. It's titled Hotel Car, but it's actually um, George Pullman's restaurant car. And if you look at the one that you saw of the 40s, it's a very different time period, but you still see a very formal dining experience when it was very, um, it was a little more expensive. It was not everybody could experience it. Reminds me a little bit of a cruise rather it, than, mm -hmm. than yeah. a train nowadays. It really does look like a cruise. It mm -hmm. really does look like a cruise. And if you notice, the ser server was an African-American person. George Pullman used the opportunity of hiring ex-slaves on his rail cars as a way for them to be able to make a living. And that's why you see a lot of people descended from Pullman Porters. And actually, the Five Points neighborhood was mm. um, originated by Pullman Porters 
who were looking for a place to stay in the Denver area as they worked on the train on the way through to California. Oh. So that neighborhood was a middle class neighborhood, uh, an African American middle class neighborhood that was founded by Pullman Porters. Wow. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg, Mayor, we Willing Mayor Webb, I can't remember his name, Wellington Webb? Not sure. Okay. Mayor, Mayor Webb, um, a, a couple of Olympic uh, athletes are known to be descendants of Pullman porters. So this huh. is a very common trait. And I haven't um, worked here more than a year, but I meet so many people who are descended from workers of the railroad. So it's oh, cool. really a part of our culture, and it's That's really so part of yeah. who we are as a nation. Even though we don't travel by train as much, it's something that we are of. And if you look at the museum, um, we have an archive that is wonderful, that holds corporate records, that holds um, a number of blueprints on how to make cars, if you want to do models, on how to make cars, um, model cars the way um, you see our galloping goose here. Um, we have records that talk about how they ate on the train, which is where I went when I was doing the research for my exhibit. But there's a huge variety of things that you can see in our archive. And we're very fortunate to have that. We also have a photo of the roundhouse, which is where they go to fix the train cars, the rail cars, excuse me, the rail cars, in order to run them on the track at the museum. So when oh, you do the Polar Express, you're going to want to make sure that train runs safely. Is it and round? It actually is in part round. Okay. Um, so if you look at the top, you see I the see. turntable and you see those bays with the geese in front mm -hmm. of them. Oh, I see. Okay. On, the, on the top of the picture. Yeah. So each bay is kind of like a, a car, a bay where you would pull your car in to fix it, mm -hmm. only in this case it's a rail car. Oh, uh, okay. And it's a little more involved because you have to put it onto the turnstile. They have to turn the turnstile, and one man can do that. Turn the turnstile, and then they push it in with a locomotive into that bay so they can fix it. And the bay goes is empty underneath. Mm -hmm. And that is open, has a um, viewing room for public to be able to watch them work on these rail cars. And I was able to go with a visitor today while the guys were working on the um, truck for uh, B8, which is one of our passengers' cars that we'll be using for Polar. Mm -hmm. And they, hadn't, um, they said it hadn't been worked on since the 1920s. It is fascinating to see these cars taken apart and watch them work on them and make them run smoothly for our guests again. Yeah, yeah you would imagine that the tools and the, and the parts, nothing is, is, is the same. You would have to find a lot of... Uh, just just different solutions for things because they're not manufactured anymore. In many cases, they're making the parts in order to have them happen. Wow. So this is not an inexpensive thing that we're doing. Right. And it, we are very fortunate to get to ride the cars that we are able to ride today. It's so cool. Yeah. It's really, really interesting. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, and and all of the information that you gave was so interesting, really very cool. And we can um, also, we should encourage you guys to visit the Colorado Railroad Museum. Um, where is it located again? It's on 44th Street, right across from Coors. Okay. And um, in Golden, just right outside of Golden. And it's beautiful this time of year. We're really lucky. The days Ooh. have been just gorgeous. So you guys better get, get out to the Colorado Railroad Museum. And definitely tell Elizabeth that you said you saw her on Homework Hotline. Um, that'll, make, that'll make them very happy. Um, but we're going to take a break. And um, when we get back, we'll answer some more questions for you.